In this example, we are interested in the time response of the function h of s when a step input is applied to it. A step input in the frequency domain is 1 over s. To find the time response of this function to that step input, we need to multiply the transfer function by the input and then take the inverse Laplace transform of the entire function. This function has uh, the, a denominator of s squared plus bs plus 9, and you are interested in the time response for different values of b. The first one that we're going to study is b equals to 9. If you write the equation in a standard form as it is, we can immediately find omega n, the natural frequency. Natural frequency here, omega n squared equals to 9. So omega n is 3 radians per second. And this is for all values of b. We can now equate the term that multiplies s in both equations here. We have that for b equals to 9 to zeta omega n equals to 9, which gives zeta as 9 over 3 times 2. This is 1.5. The damping ratio is greater than 1, which means that at this transfer function, when you take the inverse, we we'll only have exponential components. And that's because the roots or the poles of this transfer function are real numbers and distinct. All roots, the two roots that we have, are real and they are distinct. Let's take the inverse Laplace to verify this statement. This expression can be written as because the poles are real number, we can rewrite the expression as a function of the poles as shown here. The first pole is negative 7.85, the second one is 1 .14, negative 1.14, which again are the values of s that make the denominator 0. This equation now, multiplied by 1 over s, can, which is the input, can be split into three partial fractions. The first one for the first root here, the second one for the s plus 1.14, uh, and the third one for 1 over s. And when you solve for the partial fraction decomposition, we'll find the constants that we see on top there. Having expression in this format now makes it easy to find the inverse Laplace. h of s becomes h of t in the temporal domain. The first term becomes exponential of a constant times exponential of 0 0.785 t minus 1.71 exponential of minus 1.14 t and the last term is simply 1. We see that now that uh, the time response here only has exponential components and that's again given by the fact here that the uh, the damping ratio is greater than 1. All poles are distinct real numbers. If we plot the time response of this function, the function will start from 0, follow an exponential curve, and eventually reach 1. And there's again only exponential components here. Now let's repeat the same question for a different value of b. This time let's set b to 0. If b is 0, this term disappears. The natural frequency is still 3 radians per second, but now 2 zeta omega n equals to 0, which means that zeta is 0. Zeta equals to 0 means that there is no damping in the system. There is nothing dissipating energy. The system is called a undamped system. Let's find the inverse Laplace of h of s. This expression now gives 9 over s squared plus 9 times 1 over s. The partial fraction decomposition of this equation will take the form of a s plus b divided by s squared plus 9 plus c over s. If we now solve for the partial fraction, we'll find that a equals to negative 1, b equals to 0, and c equals to 1. 
does this expression we'll rewrite as h of s equals to 1 over s minus s over s squared plus 9. The inverse Laplace now is easy to calculate. h of t equals to 1 minus cosine of 3t. An interesting result again, we see that the only component that we see in this equation is a sinusoidal component. And that agrees with the observation that we have here. The damping ratio is zero. All poles of this transfer function are imaginary. In fact, they are plus minus 3j. They are only, they are purely complex numbers. If they are purely complex numbers, there, there is no real part, there is no exponential component. And again, if you look at the time response, we see that there is no exponential component. If you plot the time response, we'll get a curve that starts at zero when time is zero. Cosine of zero is one, one minus one, zero. And this curve go, goes up and down as a, as a cosine curve. The maximum value here is two. And this happens when uh, 3t equals to pi. So this becomes negative 1, 1 minus negative 1, 2. This is the time response. The frequency of oscillations here, the frequency of this sinusoidal waveform is 3 radians per second. That is the natural frequency that we calculated at the beginning. The undamped frequency of oscillations that can be clearly seen here. Let's once again repeat this exercise, but now for b equals to 6. The natural frequency of this, this system doesn't change. But now 2 zeta omega n equals to 6. Omega n is 3. So zeta, the damping ratio, is 1. A damping ratio equals to 1 characterizes a critically damped system. For a critically damped system, the poles are real, but they are equal. And in this case, the poles are both negative 3. If that is the case, we can now rewrite this expression as 9 over s plus 3 squared times 1 over s. And expand this in a partial fraction as a over s plus 3 squared plus b over s plus 3 plus c over s and so for a, b, and c. The values of a, b, and c are given here, negative 3, negative 1, and 1. We can now take the inverse Laplace of this expression. Everything can now comes from a table of Laplace transforms. And h of t now becomes, for the first term, a is negative 3 times t exponential of negative 3t. b becomes negative 1 exponential of negative 3t and plus 1. We see again, we only have exponential components, and that is expected because the, the roots of our system are real numbers. There is no exponential component. There is no imaginary component at the, in, for the pole. The function will eventually tend to 1, where you'll reach 1 following an exponential curve. And finally, let's do this exercise for b equals to 2. Now 2 zeta omega n becomes 2, omega n is 3, zeta is 1 third. Zeta is less than 1, this characterizes a underdamped system. An underdamped system has complex conjugate poles, which means that we cannot simplify this expression, we have to deal with it as it stands. Now we can apply partial fraction decomposition for this term, this will be a s plus b divided by s squared plus 2s plus 9 and plus c over s. If you solve for a, b, and c, we find the following values. Negative 1, negative 2, and positive 1. Now we need to prepare this expression, especially the denominator, in a format that can be found in a table of Laplace transform. 
and this will be similar to the previous exercise. We need to, to factor this as s plus a constant is squared, all squared plus another constant. So we can rewrite this expression as s plus 1 is squared plus 8. This is the exactly same expression. Why s plus 1 again? Because this is the only way to square this entire term and get 2s. So if you expand this equation, we get s squared plus 2s plus 1 plus 8 goes back to 9. It's what we had at the beginning. Now we need to find a way to create a s plus 1 in the numerator. To do that, we can simply factor out the negative number, so multiply everything by negative 1, and this becomes s plus 1 plus 1. So again, this negative number here multiplies everything, and plus 1 over s. This can now be written as... If you now look at a table of Laplace transform, we have a form that corresponds to this fraction exactly, and we can do the same for the second term. h of t can now be calculated as negative exponential of minus t cosine of the square root of 8t. And this term becomes negative 1 over the square root of 8 exponential of minus t sine of square root of 8t. Again, remember that we need to create a square root of 8 on top. So we can multiply it by a square root of 8 and also divide it by 1 by a square root of 8. Hence, this 1 over a square root of 8 here. And plus 1. We notice now that we have components that are both exponential and sinusoidal which agrees with the observation here that the damping ratio is smaller than 1. If we plot the time response to a step input, that's h of t as a function of time, we'll see something similar to this curve. The final value is clearly 1, but the function reaches 1 by oscillating. These oscillations will come from the complex part of the poles. The, the oscillations decay slowly because of the exponential components, and the exponential components are coming from the real part of the poles. And again, this is because the damping ratio is less than 1. The system is underdamped. Now let's summarize the key points in this exercise. In the first case, b equals to 9 resulted in a damping ratio greater than 1 and the transfer function having two distinct real poles. The poles does lie on the real axis. They have no sinusoidal component. They have no imaginary component. The time response that we got was a purely exponential response. For the second case, the damping ratio was 0. b was equal to 0. And the transfer function ended up having two purely imaginary poles, minus 3j and plus 3j. The poles lie on the imaginary axis. They have no real part, so the time response is only sinusoidal. And we got a time response that was indeed a sinusoidal response like that. In another example, b was set to 6, and we ended up with two poles that were real but equal. This characterizes a critically damped system. The damping ratio is decreased compared to this one. It's now 1, and if the damping ratio keeps decreasing, now the poles will become complex conjugates. At this specific point where they are equal, the system is called a critically damped system. The time response for a critically damped system is also a exponential response. There is no way to visually distinguish the time response of a overdamped system and a critically damped system. In the last case, when b equals to 2, the damping ratio was less than 1. 
which resulted in poles being imaginary complex conjugate numbers. The poles would have both imaginary and real parts. The real part creates an exponential component in the time response, and the imaginary part creates a sinusoidal response. To plot the time response for this specific case, the time response of H of S will follow this trend. So when the poles lie on the real axis, there is no imaginary component, there is no sinusoidal component. When the poles lie on the imaginary axis, there is no real component, there is only sinusoidal components in the time response, there is only imaginary poles. And when the poles lie anywhere in this S-plane other than the axis, then you have a combination of real and imaginary components we have a combination of exponential and sinusoidal waveforms.